uh, Panel 6, uh, Diplomacy in the Cold War, and uh, U US Diplomacy in the Cold War, sorry. And the chair will be Anita Such, my colleague uh, at Corvins University of Budapest, and I hope uh, she's here, and yes, she is. So uh, uh, thanks for joining us. And from now on, I give the floor to you. So pe please collect your people, uh, ask them to uh, show up uh, by the camera, uh, and they should be uh, visible during your panel. And then, of course, as I said, uh, only the speaker should uh, switch on the microphone once you give the floor to the presenters. So thanks for taking this job. So the floor is yours, Anita, now. Thank you very much uh, indeed. So uh, I hope all my presenters here because I can see only one so far, but I I really warmly welcome you to, to this sixth panel of this Cold War conference. And uh, let me say it's a great honor to be here. So thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> uh, and. Uh, well, uh, Professor Bekes has introduced me, so I am on it to teach and I work for the Cornell University. And I had to admit that my interest is, is highly theoretical. Usually I deal with uh, these theoretical issues, theory of international relations, and I deal with French issues, French foreign political issues as well. So, so I'm only really interested in these aspects of Cold War, what usually I do not face it. So as a regular um, participant here in Cold War conferences for many years, I can say that, that one of the great virtues of this conference is that it creates personal contact. And uh, unfortunately this year the pandemic didn't allow us to meet in person, but, but technology has found a solution to this problem, so uh, that's great. <clears throat> so uh, let me start uh, the panel with some, with some technical if you, uh, information, so I hope that I repeat those information who, uh, what, what uh, Professor Bekesh has already told you. So I would like to ask the participant to please uh, Turn down your voices uh, during uh, um, during the uh, the panel. So mute yourself and turn off the camera as well. Uh, speakers, those speakers uh, who do not speak. So while you are not speaking, please turn on uh, or off the camera. Uh, turn on the camera. Uh, yes. So speakers have to turn on the camera, but have to mute themselves except those who are speaking up, uh, of course, and uh, I'd like to really ask all the participants to, to mute you know, yourself because background noises can be very unpleasant. unpleasant. So um, I spent uh, the last semester in teams, I think, with you as well. So really, I, I could tell stories about bird singing and uh, construction noises, but we have, I think, quite interesting topics to discuss. <clears throat> and uh, while we are on the subject, uh, I like to say a word about the panel itself. So we have three presentations, uh, and the free presentation will be held at first, and this will be followed by questions. So I would encourage you. I would like uh, like to encourage all the participants, including myself and the speakers and the audience, to ask questions, have comments, remarks, and. Uh, <clears throat> I think at the end we will have approximately 15 minutes uh, for a good discussion. Uh, I hope that's similar discussion uh, as we had. So I do hope that uh, you 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 will all add some comments to to this panel. Okay, so this panel shows us uh, three exciting sides of the American diplomacy um, and three. Uh, exciting aspects of the Cold War international order, and this international order was based on American hegemony. And uh, hegemony is not only um, something which created political, economic, and military order um, in the politics, but it created and maintained a normative structure as well. 
So uh, the, go the Cold War bipolar world order was based on the liberal world order, which was promoted mainly by the United States. And um, these were values characteristic of Western political culture embodied in, in major liberal uh, democracies. And the Radio Free Europe was one of the emblematic voices of these values. So um, that will be uh, the first presentation about. And what caught my attention in the facts was that the focus of this lecture, um, did I understand correctly that, that we are going to hear about how the norms that were thought to be objective, and rational, that defined Western values. So how these norms were established as, as rational? And Anna Grutze, please share your thoughts on that issue. So you have no more than 20 minutes to, to speak. Anna is here from the CEU, from Vienna. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's, indeed, it's a very honor to have this opportunity to present. Uh, my work on Radio for Europe here, and indeed, it will deal with objectivity and the question of of norms and and framing and Western and U.S. hegemony. Um, I would try to to share my screen. I've never done that in in Teams, but I hope that that works as easily as as elsewhere, like Zoom. May I ask if you see my presentation? Yes. Yes, good. So um, my topic for today uh, is Radio Free Europe and the Cold War Agency Crisis. You see uh, under title you ask Cold War scientists and fa fact makers and the trap of perception and pure objectivity. Um, what I would like to present today would be firstly a short introduction actually on the failure of uh, predicting 1989 and uh, a Sovietology and also Sovietologists and uh, social scientists' um, inability to foresee actually the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, then I will go on and, and talk about some paradoxes of cultural rationality, rationality as uh, to my mind uh, very particular frames of, of thinking of the Cold War and of the Cold War objectivity. And then I, I will try to uh, move forward to Radio Free Europe and see how this kind of frames of rationality and rationality could be applied to the way Radio Free Europe worked and how it actually uh, framed uh, emotions. So as a history of emotion will play a, a big role here and we'll talk about the objectivity or subjective objectivity of hope and fear. Um, so let me start with the introduction. Among American students of Russia, writes Stephen Kotkin, the mood surrounding the events of the late 1980s and early 1990s rollercoasted upward from initial surprise to giddy euphoria and then downward deep to deep disillusionment and embarrassing perplexity. Perhaps nowhere else were the effects ramified, for nowhere else did perception of Russia constitute so integral a part of the national fabric. How could America's Sovietologists not have predicted the end of the Soviet Union? How could they have failed to explain the consequences of Gorbachev's perestroika? How could it be that in the late 1980s, as such experienced political scientists like Zbigniew Brzezinski still regarded the Soviet system as unchangeable and not inclined to reform? After the collapse, the criticism against Sovietologists was especially strong. But the what went wrong debate was in no sense limited to academia, as claims David Engelman. Officials at the CIA faced a series of congressional and public attacks for having missed the Soviet collapse. They were accused of playing politics and accepting Soviet claims, resulting in one of the worst strategic blunders in the Cold War. The boundaries among ivory tower, press rooms, embassies, and governmental briefing rooms have anyway already broken down. And this, I would say, already at the end of the 1940s, mostly due to the rich financial support of intermediaries like the Rockefeller Foundation and RAND. Certainly, the failure of Sovietology can be ascribed to the fields in attentions. The subject faced existential crises from the 1970s onwards. What additionally posed a major problem, I think, was the question of framing. 
Western framing, Western blueprints, Western categories, and Western concepts of the Soviet other, the to some extent indispensable enemy that satisfied a deep psychological need for an immut immutably ugly Soviet Union. Martin Melia, for instance, criticizes America's research experts' application of social scientific concepts rooted in Western experience. The failure of Sovietology to understand the damage of the USSR, Mali insisted, was a failure of the social sciences per se. What I would like to concentrate on in this paper are the rationalities and premises of objectivity used by early Cold War journalists who borrowed from social scientists who deployed those categories and premises first in their laboratory and then real life experimental settings in the early 1950s. A certain idea of rationality based on a very fierce and almost religious trust in numbers, algorithms, strategic operations, rational choice theory and game theory shaped the assumptions and frames of the scientists to an extent that irrationality appeared to be the highly simplified characteristic of the non-Western other. The enemy had to be feared due to his or her unpredictability and the uncertainty created in terms of spontaneous or supposedly irrational actions, including the conditional potentiality of dangerous, if not even disastrous, nuclear attacks. Sight and seeing the enemy, information and knowing the enemy, and forecast or scientific prediction, that means knowing his future moves, became the major fields of interest of scientists and intelligence agents alike. However, similar to Karl Popper's utopian engineer who attempts to realize an ideal state using a blueprint of a society as a whole, the problem with political science was its insistence on being scientific, on developing and applying general laws that would fit all societies. The social science perspective necessarily posited that society is essentially the same everywhere, which in turn implied that society, Soviet society and politics could be interpreted with categories and techniques originally formulated to understand solely the West. In what follows, I would like to briefly sketch some of these frames and premises of objective interrationality developed at RAND in order to show in a second step how they influenced the work of journalists and scientists at Radio Free Europe. Finally, I want to draw the attention to the consequences of these misperceptions, asking about the role of emotions, rumors, random choice and common sense played in the belief systems of the observed other and the truth regimes of Radio for Europe. In the Cold War logic of war prevention, human emotions like fear, rage, anxiety were understood as dangerous factors. The nuclear catastrophe of human annihilation that it could cause by accident or fatal error revealed the weakness of human agents as rational decision makers. In this sense, cultural rationality was summoned into being in order to tame the terrors of the citizens too consequential to be left to human reason alone, traditionally understood as mindful de deliberation. In the face of potential human-made catastrophe, the human decision makers lost their credibility and trustworthiness as totally reliable actors who could exert perfect self-control. While the Victorians and Vincent became the savage, the barbarian and the cannibal, archetypal Western symbols personifying the dark persons of man, order to strategically constitute the moral character, racial purity and sexual virtue of British people ourselves, the rightful descendants of imperial ambitions in the US transferred the control and the achievement of pure objectivity and reason to psychological interviewing techniques. Non-human agents, algorithms, machines, larger agency like RAND and social scientists. These soldiers of reason were installed not only to control the mind, but as well to open it. Ideas of brainwashing, mind control of behavioral and psychological experiments, however heightened especially that what they were designed to prevent. Imaginaries and nervous expressions of new and old anxieties in terms of human autonomy and agency. Finally, the post-war period was everything else than void of fear. Fear was an emotion that shapes the lives of the citizens of both superpowers decisively. 
On both sides, surveillance and the hunting of inner enemies destroyed social relations and created a pervasive atmosphere of distrust. In the US, this type of social control fostered through information processing systems, communication networks and technology, nourish divisions of, and narratives of a world in which individuals are forever manipulated by secret agents, hidden persuaders, and malevolent organizations. Conspiracy theory, paranoia, and anxiety about human agency are all part of that paradox of Cold War rationality. Seamus Mali refers to this phenomenon as agency panic, the conviction that one's actions are being controlled by somebody else, that one has been constructed by powerful external agents. At the same time, Rand analysts stumbled onto a brilliant discourse that provided both a way to maximize efficiency in government and a philosophical foundation for the West's ideological struggle with the communist bloc. The numbers driven perspective had the effect of divorcing ethical questions from the job at hand. Two main characters have to be mentioned here. The mathematician John Davis Williams and the economist Keynes Arrow. Williams personified what would become hallmarks of realities, a dedication to abstract theory and a sense of absolute self-righteousness married to an amoral approach to politics and, and policy. Williams believed that every human activity could be understood and explained by numerical rationality. Refining the concept of operation analysis, Randities led by Williams set out to create an analytical system that would identify policy choices, evaluate them scientifically, and allow policymakers to base their choices on ostensibly rational, objective criteria. Error, on the other hand, became one of the main proponents of the rational choice doctrine, assuming that life was deterministic. The underlying assumption of his studies was that by examining the mathematical probabilities of particular causes of action and tabulating each in assumed order of preference, one could predict how a person would choose. It is life as numbers game, its corollary being the common fallacy, namely that which, which doesn't compute can be safely disregarded. Ron Robin claims in this respect that practitioners of game theory dismissed problems that were not quantifiable and ignored the chaotic elements of history and culture and the effects on decision making. In the confusing period of the early 1950s, such issues were overlooked. The Cold War was terra incognita and in need of a map. The application of a grid of mathematics fulfilled this graphical lacuna. Mathematics and the trust in numbers guaranteed a failed strategic advantage, predictability, visibility, and legibility. At the same time, the resulted special powers of seeing into and penetrating otherwise mysterious phenomena of human behavior. But this visibility and forms of seeing had its price. They oversimplified, reduced, reified, and created fictions. As consequences, blurring of fact and fiction could be used to project collective fears and desires of cold war enemies. Much like everyday rumors, the enemy as rumor represented an attempt to resolve uncertainty, compensate for crucial information voids, and reframe a chaotic world in familiar forms. Rumor, an amalgam of opaque knowledge and cultural codes, transformed a distant adversary into a clear and present danger. It is then maybe no wonder that among American strategic psychological operations was the use of rumor as a means of influencing the minds of larger audiences. Ready for Europe was a radio station that was situated in Munich and worked under US umbrella from the early 1950s onwards in order to communicate anti-communist messages to the people behind the Iron Curtain. RP's mission and purpose were not at all innocent. According to Simon Mikkonen, US authorities at the end of the Second World War were not at all powerful players and strategists, but actors deprived of reliable access to valuable information. Immediately after the Second World War, 
U.S. authorities found themselves with very little information about conditions in the USSR. The United States therefore tried to reach across the Iron Curtain to increase its knowledge while avoiding direct military conflict and making effort to cultivate indirect methods of getting at its adversary. It was in this context that Radio Free Europe in 1950 and Radio Liberation 1953, or Radio Liberty as later known, came into existence. In the Cold War information war, radio was, as Linda Risso claims, definitely one of the weapons of choice. The US State Department and CIA regarded RFE as a means of psychological warfare. For the CIA in particular, RFE became a crucial supply of information. According to Ados Johnson, the CIA early became a consumer rather than a source of this information. RV created, therefore, as well, a vast information gathering system, which included a research department, a monitoring section of communist broadcasts, and a collection of Eastern European publications, and conducted interviews with travelers and refugees. And moreover, RV had to dispose a highly sophisticated modern technology, including as well a cataloging system designed to order and provide better legibility and retrievability of ever bigger amounts of new data. Underground pamphlets, files, and journals that RFE used in order to verify facts and falsities and fake news. To be objective was RFE's self proclaimed goal, but it retained, despite the clear obstacles it faced in reaching the place of events as well as its audience and informants. At the same time, RFE's entanglement with US American anti communist institutions, the CIA, and the US government made its impartiality very doubtful. RFE operated in a very biased manner, relying quite often on its pre-existing Western attitudes. It was there to free Eastern European captives and slaves of communism from the chains of innocence by appealing to their hearts and minds. To a certain extent, there are strong similarities between RAND and Radio Free Europe, as can be seen, for instance, here in the quote, uh, from an interview uh, procedure for a public opinion survey with refugees, saying that uh, interviewees do, need, do not need to be afraid, although it might happen, uh, because they should recognize that the nature of an inquiry is very schematic and mechanical, and finally actually will be group-oriented and statistical. So uh, emotions will be nevertheless reduced to mere numbers. Furthermore, not only did the staff members often change position between institutions and the CIA, but RFE can be said to have functioned like a laboratory or calculation center. Bruno Latour defines the letter as places that rest on predictability of the formulas calculations, guaranteeing trust, accountability, and stability because of their functioning like the expected performance of a machine. For Latour, objectivity, rationalization, and hence of facts emerge from inside the walls of these calculation centers. In ta ta taking a closer look at RP, we find, first of all, no bare words, no naked truths, but masses of material, catalogs, and the newest technology. See human actors carefully engage in epistemic practices. The US administration and the US information agency thought it crucial to create the atmosphere of objectivity. So as information agency, however, defined objective reporting not as neutral or disinterested, but urged the agents, Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty to sound objective, that is to tell the truth, providing dispassionate, genuine information and to convince and to be convincing without engaging in naked, shameless propaganda as the Soviets did. This meant at the same time that politicians, as well as many Western journalists, seem to be convinced that history and truth was on the American side. Objectivity, those understood, was not a view from nowhere, but a view from the West. However, as German philosopher Ernst Kassir once claimed, man does not live in the world of hard facts alone. He lives rather in the midst of imaginary emotions and hopes and fears, in illusions and disillusions, in his fantasies and dreams. Kassira regarded the human world as ruled by our senses and emotions than by objective reasoning. Emotions such as fear and hope or sentiments of trust and distrust were key to everyday life experiences of the Cold War. They were part of social reality, 
structuring and changing it in the same ways as truth it lasted. Similarly, Melissa Feinberg shows how refugee stories were shaped by and in turn helped create a Cold War political culture that revolved around the poles of fear and truth. Feinberg regards these two poles as mutually enforcing codes which shape the perception of social reality. Her underlying assumption is that both fear and truth were responsible for a certain level of distortion in regard to the perception of social reality in Eastern Europe, caused by reflexive but unchallenged feedback loops between both sides, Radio Free Europe and RFE's listeners. In so doing, she analyzes how citizens of Eastern Europe, while trying to make sense of their own reality, depended on the view of outside observers like Radio Free Europe, and according to Feinberg, very willingly incorporated these foreign interpretations into their own patterns of behavior and belief systems. This unverifiable potentiality of a network of hidden and faceless agents, the stories of self-proclaimed witnesses of terror, rumors of things unseen, and finally the feedback loops between both sides open the floor for a regime of phantasmorgias, experiences of collective hallucination of watchers being watched, suspicion and distrust that substantially destroyed the public sphere as a realm of free speech, creating a society of atomized individuals who are afraid to trust one another. The so imagined powers of Soviet secret services diverged, however, strongly from reality and statistics. Looking at RFE's broadcasts, this meant above all two things. On the one hand, the freedom and truth broadcast confirmed the common sense knowledge that terror and surveillance were omnipresent and the Soviet regime capable of any kind of cruelty against reality and against statistics. On the other hand, as the American broadcasters had succeeded in framing their wartime international broadcasting as a bacon of hope and truth, those who hoped for liberation read widely meaning into the broadcast and interpreted them in the light of their own hopes. Finally, the frame that RFE used to select information and to judge its content was not objective, but favored those stories that corresponded to their own anti-communist idea of a Soviet threat. They too transformed the gathered information into mutually supporting evidence. Emotions such as hope and fear were among the driving forces that shaped the interpretive frames and selective patterns. RFE not only engaged in epistemic politics in broadcasting truths beyond the Iron Curtain, it stimulated fantasy, it fed hope. Emotions, however, remain the characteristic of the observed Soviet other. The dispassionate and objective analysis was a work of Cold War US scientists, as shown by the interview guide of the Harvard Refugee Interview Project. I would maybe just quickly read out uh, the last point here, how American interviewers are described vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russians, Russian refugees whom they interview. It says, most of what there is to any about the characteristics of Americans as interviewers of Russians is the, is the reverse of what is discussed under the heading of Russians as respondents. By and large, Americans are unaccustomed to the direct and spontaneous expression of emotions to which Russians are likely to give in. Therefore, American and in American interviewees, uh, American interviewers may, may well be embarrassed or at loss as to how to handle such situations. So emotions very clearly uh, appear as uh, characteristics of Russians, while Americans do not uh, dispose such uh, feelings in an interview situation. To conclude, Ernst Bloch has claimed once that since Marx, no research into truth and no realistic judgment is possible at all, which will be able to avoid subjective and objective hope contents of the world without paying triviality or reaching a dead end. Rand, RFE, and early Cold War social scientists have been prone to a common misperception that Robert Jervis has described some years later, namely to see the behavior of others as more centralized, planned, and coordinated than it is. People seem to be unable to accept the idea of a random situation. Instead, they try to read order into random data. But not only random constellations were left out, but emotions, 
even in psychology, grew for a long time little attention cultural sciences. Behaviorists and later cognitive psychologists working in the lab did not, until 1970, see any way to approach them. Clinical psychologists following Freud's lead regarded emotions as relatively unimportant in themselves. Meanwhile, the trust in members and quantification guaranteed classifications for the exercise of power in foreign lands. Surveillance was much more based on legibility and visibility than on a sensorial relationship, one might argue. However, as Julia Komskas claims, there is a strong resemblance between the workings of Soviet bloc secret police agencies and radio bureau, namely in the relationship to the senses, especially sight and sound. Both were inaccessible to the public eye by vividly present in private and public imagination. If so, then RFD failed, as for instance, where the Romania Secretariate did, to successfully produce frames and blueprints in order to understand the effective knowledge of the people behind the Iron Curtain. Catherine Verdery focuses on the invisibility of the Secretariate of Practices that is played an obsession with control. She says, Behind this need to control everything lay a paralyzing sense of fear generated by the uncontrollable, by the fact that some things that exist in the souls, the thoughts, and the life of people that is slipping through their fingers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation indeed. I learned a lot. I, as you have mentioned, I also firmly believe that that behind uh, the so-called perceived certainty of a kind of unshakable values um, lies the uh, exciting process of norm building. So, so the more we know about how we define our own identity or how actors define their own identity. Um, the more aware citizens we become. So uh, let's say that one of the great moments of radio free Europe was the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. So I myself have seen countless literally and, and cinematograph works how the radio embodied um, a unified freedom and prosperity as a kind of symbolic and, and iconic product of, of that time. So the question is, is how did the American government view uh, the events of 1956? Uh, how was information gathered? How did communication have subsequent decision making? And exactly, Joel Mate will talk to us about about this aspect, about another in different important aspect of, of communication. And I, as I can see, Jolt is here. And uh, he came from the beautiful southern part of Hungary, from Pitch. So I like to ask you, please take the floor and uh, start the presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to ask just for a second to be able to share my screen. Yes. Can you see my slides? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Page and also a high school teacher at the university. And uh, I write my dissertation about how the American, the Canadian, and the Australian government handled the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. How did they react to this event? Today, I'd like to talk about how the American government uh, gathered uh, the information about the Hungarian Revolution. How did the foreign policies uh, offices uh, discussed uh, the events, how did they get their information, how did the US communicate with the world in the backgrounds in 1956. Uh, this is a very important topic to understand uh, how 
did the Eisenhower government made the decision not sending American or NATO troops to Hungary and uh, also why they could make a decision that quickly a few days late after the revolution. Also, since these uh, telegraphs came from all around the world, this is a very unique uh, documentation to get information about how the world reacted to the Hungarian revolution. These are around 600 documents, uh, what I found in 2015 in Washington, uh, D.C., I mean in College Park, uh, the at the College Park location of the National Archives uh, in the United States of America. You can see the, the uh, citation of the boxes, and uh, I we'll talk a little bit more about these documents. Most of them were classified for several years. Me uh, technically, almost all of them are telegraphs. In some cases, there are uh, postal letters, but most of them are uh, inner telegraphs of the foreign policy, uh, uh, foreign offices, and uh, there are two ways of the communication. Most of them came from the American embassies all around the world. And uh, in very few of them came from Washington DC to the embassies or the foreign offices. The way and the type of documentation are different in these two cases, because from abroad, the embassies collected uh, information about how the government or the local government or how the local society reacted to the Hungarian revolution. And uh, they wrote reports about this. Also, not just in the days of the revolution, but a few uh, days after the Soviet uh, attack against Hungary, uh, they also reported information about how the countries uh, would behave about Hungarian refugees. Would they accept them or they would refuse them? And on the other hand, the US uh, State Department would send communiques to the uh, offices, to the foreign offices, how the local ambassador or the consul uh, can talk about the American decision or what the office uh, should especially uh, look for information. In some countries, I will show, they, uh, they are, had special glass uh, for these. Here's an example. This is a telegraph, uh, telegram from Brussels. And this, this just says uh, how the local socialist uh, uh, meeting uh, made a decision about the Hungarian refugee. This is just an example. There's more than hundreds of them. Of course, most of these telegrams or telegraphs uh, were sent from uh, Budapest. Many of them, uh, e there were even many of them in a single day, sometimes even a dozen in a single day. And, and uh, for this was followed by Vienna, which was very crucial because the Hungarian telegrams went through Vienna. So uh, from Vienna, not just the Hungarian, but also some local information was gathered. Of course, Moscow, that was a, a very important uh, embassy for the US at this time. And London, Paris was very important as in the, uh, in the NATO and also Belgrade. In Africa and Asia, uh, many of the countries did not even have any reports, even if they had uh, an American consulate or uh, embassy. For example, from Japan, I could not find any uh, local telegrams, uh, which, is, uh, which could happen because of an archival, uh, uh, archival decision or because there wasn't any importance of the the Hungarian Revolution, I would uh, choose the first option uh, a little bit more. Uh, and now I would show some uh, 
reports and from summaries from uh, these documents. And I would like to take you to all around the world to imagine how uh, uh, how some big countries reacted to the Hungarian Revolution. For example, Athens uh, said it, the Greek uh, politicians thought this is an anti-communist revolution and not a Titoist. And as you can see in many of the countries, at the first week uh, after the revolution's opening, uh, the country's leaders could not even understand what type of revolution is this, what Hungary wants. They want to totally free, uh, totally free from the Eastern Bloc. They want to be a Western member, or they just want uh, they just want a different type of leadership. So the first week, in many cases, was uh, led by getting information what's happening in Hungary and how to understand what's happening in Hungary. Even in smaller countries like Haiti, uh, they were even solidarity. Uh, they they were already uh, supporting Hungary. This was mainly, mainly a diplomatic support at the United Nations, or uh, in, but in some cases, especially in Europe, they send uh, food or uh, utilities or even money or blood to Hungary. Um, the during the days of the revolution, most of the reports uh, were not just how to find uh, what happening, what happens in Hungary. Uh, the United, uh, uh, the American embassies uh, explained the situation in Hungary in many cases to the leaders of the countries, but also the whole communication and getting reports were sometimes uh, public, sometimes uh, unpublished. unpublished. For example, in uh, the first pages of the newspapers, many countries already showed what's their political decision uh, about Hungary. But in many cases, especially in the third world, uh, the US diplomats could get information only in the backgrounds in some uh, unofficial meetings of, with the leaders, uh, which shows that uh, for many countries, uh, the hung supporting the Hungarian revolution was uh, a very critical question. For example, Finland uh, or Afghanistan, they don't want it to publish the, their opinion. The leaders that uh, were supporting Hungary, but uh, only in an un unofficial way. Also, in uh, the documents, showing a big uh, difference in, in, the, in the support of Hungary in the way that some of them were supporting the American goals and decisions in the United States, United Nations, but some of them were only a political support. Uh, there's only one exception with India where the American uh, diplomats wrote that the government doesn't have enough information what to think about Hungary. And there were some other regions of the world where um, the Hungarian revolution already was seen as a freedom fight. Now I would like to talk a little bit more about some special regions of the world in the view of the reports. The American embassies in the Eastern Blocs, uh, in the Eastern Bloc, had the main goal to get as much information as possible about the Soviet decision, what they will do about Hungary. This is a very important uh, collection because since at the end of October in Moscow, uh, Khrushchev and the High Committee makes a decision uh, to send Soviet troops. Uh, against Hungary, the US already seen uh, that from the local reports that the Warsaw Pact together would not support an invasion against Hungary. For example, Poland uh, was a big supporter of uh, the Hungarian events and uh, Gomulka did not support uh, sending uh, Polish troops against Hungary. That's also another main goal of what Khrushchev did of, uh, in the first days of November 
to visit uh, the, uh, the Warsaw Pact countries to get their support, but the US already knew it before that uh, these countries would not cooperate together. Uh, only the Soviet troops had to handle the situation. Also, uh, these uh, American embassies all around the world was uh, working on getting information on the Eastern Bloc, not just from the Eastern Bloc, but they organized meetings with Yugoslavia's Polish uh, or other countries' ambassadors or uh, consuls abroad. So, for example, because of this, uh, the US already known that, for example, Yugoslavia was not interested in uh, sending troops uh, to support or to crush Hungarian uh, or the Hungarian revolution. And for example, that's quite important to see the Yugoslavia's ambassador in London thought this is a tragic event, what happened in Hungary, which shows that, uh, which shows Yugoslavia's opinion. Uh, also, that they were not uh, supporting the Hungarian Revolution at this stage. Scandinavia was a very unique region because from many countries, uh, the US diplomats could get information about the communist or leftist political movements or organizations or parties were supporting the Hungarian Revolution which was uh, quite rare all around the world since uh, uh, since uh, what we know the hungarian revolution uh, almost uh, pushed to the zero, uh, pushed to the bottom the support of the hungary uh, the leftist parties all around the world so this is quite rare there were supporters of the uh, Hungarian Revolution and also the fundraising uh, was organized here by local uh, Scandinavian people, not just from the Hungarian diaspora. Many, uh, many books in the past uh, compiled the Suez crisis with the Hungarian Revolution together. And that's why the reports from Arabian countries uh, or Islamic countries uh, are important to see what was their opinion about the Hungarian Revolution. And this is quite interesting because men, most of the countries did not even have an opinion. Many of them were wait, lay, uh, waiting for the Arab League's uh, decision how to react to Hungarian Revolution, but uh, the Arab League could not, uh, did not discuss the topic uh, before the Suez crisis. And when the invasion in Suez happened, uh, the Arab League did not even discuss the, the question. And uh, from this region, we, uh, the US did not get any more uh, reports and the telegrams. South America was a very unique region, uh, how they responded to the Hungarian Revolution, they were supporting the US goal since the beginning in the United Nations to keep the Hungarian topic uh, on, uh, above, um, in the, in, keep them on in the news in the United Nations. And also they were mainly supporting Hungary as freedom fighters, heroes of uh, freedom. And they fought since the beginning. This is a totally uh, uh, a fight that goes for the total independence of Hungary, not just uh, a new uh, socialist uh, country. Also, many countries have Hungarian diaspora, and uh, because of this, the local Hungarian community is a, a very important factor in the local politics at this time. And they visited American embassies, especially in uh, Western Europe. They made uh, protests uh, sometimes. And uh, also their request for American support in Hungary uh, has some evidence in the telegrams. And this is very important to see how much information the US could get about the local Hungarian communities. And they were very active uh, to get support for Hungary. And also we can see some cooperation with other 
nationalities from Eastern Europe, and they not just organized the uh, protests together against the Soviet Union, but also uh, fund, uh, raised some funds to help Hungary. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Budapest had the most uh, telegrams and reports. Uh, you can see the embassy's uh, building on the picture with the protest. At the beginning, in the first few days of the revolution, there was a technical issue uh, because the cable, the direct con uh, cable, telegram cable was uh, cut uh, towards Vienna. And after they fixed the, the number of the telegrams uh, was raised too. And uh, also they constantly gathered information what's going on in Hungary. And also it was very important uh, to see how, how much information they had about the events. They, the American diplomats could even talk with the, gov the new uh, members of the new government. Uh, but the only problem of this topic that uh, this is uh, concentrated to Budapest. There we can read barely about uh, uh, events in the, in the villages or in other cities. But this also uh, shows that the how uh, how uh, well organized was the uh, the embassy in Budapest to be able to get as many information as possible uh, about the possibilities of Hungary and the politics of of Imenod. And uh, there was a very unique uh, request uh, from the State Department to get uh, permission for uh, a press briefing because uh, even if Imre Nagy uh, know the American decision about not sending troops in, uh, in Hungary, the local press was interested in uh, how, what's the US's reaction to the events. So that's why an unofficial uh, briefing uh, happened at the beginning of uh, November. A uh, question what I would not like to discuss a little bit more because I'm at the end of my time is the question of the Hungarian refugees because uh, some of the telegrams have information about this and uh, mainly the telegrams uh, from November uh, gets information what, uh, how can a country help to Austria or Yugoslavia and that's why it's very nice to see that some countries send just only a few tons of cor uh, corn or food to Austria, but there was a big support from all around the world to help the Hungarian refugees. In the future, I would like to extend my research with uh, documents and telegrams of uh, the Australian diplomacy, because uh, Australia was a temporary member of the Security Council in the United Nations, and they have so many uh, familiar documents. And with this, we can probably have a, a much uh, a wider view how the world reacted to the Hungarian refugees, uh, Hungarian refugees and to the Hungarian revolution. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, George. That was again a very, very fascinating and interesting lecture. Uh, on this question. So I think <clears throat> there's no doubt that the American diplomacy was very busy in the 50s um, during the hot spots of the Cold War. So in the 50s, another uh, diplomatic relationship, the American-Turkish relations was also on a new footing and uh, that will be the topic of our new um, lecture or presentation and the new foundation of uh, the economic diplomacy will be built on economic interests and values. Murat, it's your turn. How do you see what was the most important cohesive force of these relations? Uh, I'd like to introduce you Murat Ipitski, uh, who discusses American Turkish foreign relations by focusing on business diplomacy and uh, American um, 
investment in Turkey between a certain time period. So take the floor, please. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my... Okay, no, not yet. This one, I guess. So can you see my uh, presentation? And also, can you hear me, by the way, clearly? Yes, we clearly hear you, uh, but I think you you need to press a, a F5 or something to make bigger your presentation. Actually, I did, but let me check it again, if you don't mind. So, how do you see it right now? We can see only, uh, not a presentation, but a part of your screen. Oh my God, so maybe, let me it's try it again, if you don't frozen. mind. I don't know. Uh, so can you see it right now, or should I change? Another presentation. I we can see clearly you, but not a presentation. Oh my God, so. Let me just find the problem. Yes. In the upper row. Yes, something has started. Here is it. I think that should be your presentation. Yeah, definitely. So you can see it right now, right? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, so it was quite overwhelming. Okay, so uh, my name is Murat Pikshi and I'm a PhD student uh, at Bilkent University in the Department of American History. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about my uh, dissertation and my project, research project actually, uh, which focuses on American multinational companies and that entered the uh, Turkish market in the 1950s and the role of American actors in this context. So, in my opinion, these companies and people were very important to evaluate Turkish-American uh, political, economic, and cultural relations uh, in that period. And I'm presenting my study in a kind of a chronological order. In fact, every step in uh, politics, economics seems starting a kind of a chain reaction. Uh, for instance, losing Germany, uh, the main trade partner in 1945, isolated by the Allies politically, uh, Turkey was uh, pleased to defend it by the Americans against the Soviet threats in 1946. And that political closeness uh, included Turkey to the uh, first Truman Doctrine in 1947, then in the Marshall Plan to next next year. So. And then witnessing functionality of the American products and services in Turkey referred a kind of a big brother role to the American economic institutions in the uh, 1950s. So uh, Turkey was, uh, I mean, very much more eager uh, to form more partnerships with the American businesses uh, for its uh, economic modernization and development in the 1950s. So, they decided to took every necessary step to towards it. And throughout this period, the, the American business economic culture was more settled in Turkey. So uh, if, if I go more like, like, okay. So American experts and economists uh, and diplomats took a leading role in the in those processes. Each of them either used diplomacy uh, or formed a kind of a constructive diplomatic tone to attract Turkish decision makers in the first place. Uh, then they earned Turks trust actually and showed that how the US investments could be valuable for the Turkish modernization. And also they brought them together with the uh, agents of the American multinationals and advised Turkey to bring more foreign capital in terms of economic sustainable and growth. So in the 1950s, a uh, number of these actors increased rapidly in Turkey. And they were like uh, touching on different types of uh, sectors from like engineers working in infrastructure construction or even some operators in meatpacking industry. So Americans were all over in the Turkish market. 
So all these diplomats and the experts were so influential to attract the, uh, both American multinational companies to the Turkish market, and as well as the, the ruling party in Turkey. So the ruling party started to pass foreign investment incentive laws and adopted a more liberal economic policy eventually. So these people and American companies indeed changed the framework of Turkey in the 1950s. So this is my opinion. Uh, right. The American motivation. So with the end of the World War II, uh, we see that the, both Truman administration and its successor Eisenhower administration uh, followed a more active foreign policy that abandoned all aspects of uh, political and economic isolation. Uh, that change can be linked with the uh, concept of the American century and announced by the Time magazine editor Henry Luce who also owned a different business ventures all over the world, by the way. So the idea of transferring American influence and values to other countries has become a kind of a state policy. And in fact, the American business circles were also up to such an uh, expansion in the post-World War II period, actually, because American economists and professionals sent to various countries to, world, uh, uh, to examine not only the uh, damage done to the economies, as well as spotting new profitable markets for them. Uh, so, for example, uh, the Marshall Plan, uh, which is also formed in the by contributions and proposals of the American business circles uh, included the establishment of free market capitalism in, in its agenda. The goal was to form, uh, form a basis of American economic understanding in friendly countries, uh, as well as the, the efforts to raise uh, funds for the restoration of European economies. So that's why relying on the Marshall Plan funds, American companies through their products and services safely advanced to the foreign markets. Uh, in line with these aims, American experts and advisors were also sent to overseas, as I told you before. So they, they ease the arrival of these companies to these unknown markets. Uh, moreover, these actors and companies also made a significant impact on political parameters as well. So, I guess fighting against communism required a kind of a financial health of the allied states. And if they admire the American methods or achieve a kind of an integrated common market, that will be due to. So even in political dimension, um, American multinational companies and their owners uh, put a great emphasis on supporting allied states with their tools. So uh, for example, in 1950s, most of the American businessmen were praising Turkey's uh, stench ally position and its uh, dedicated fight against the Soviet expansion in, in its region as well as in Korea. So investing in Turkey by uh, expanding products and services and uh, helping that country with the, the capital investment or providing know-how to modernize itself was in line with the American methods became their pri priority. Also, they enjoy the profits of the untapped markets as well. So. So Turkey in the late 1940s was uh, considered a kind of a backward country in American advisors' scholarships. So it was it was indeed a young republic uh, founded in 1923, uh, highly agricultural country, majority of population uh, consisted by peasants, uh, with a few industrial initiatives. And actually having no experience in industrialization previously. So the founding fathers of Turkey stubbornly insisted on a kind of a statist economy. And the modernization was based on this statist economy, but, and I should say they decided to exclude foreign investments. And they had a valid for they, they had a valid reason for that actually, because they were all the Ottoman officers who experienced Western imperialism over the uh, like crumbling empire in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries. And also they were quite enlightened people uh, believe that Western methods were promising for the industrialization and modernization. However, uh, like in the 1940s, they could not dare to rely on these former imperialists only besides uh, their old allied Germany. 
So, uh, so the emergence of the United U.S. institutions, American institutions, and in terms of supporting Turkish army and economy through the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan meant so much for Turkey. So the cautiously, initially, cautiously, uh, Turkey first invited the American economists to Turkey to work on a kind of a, a country studies, uh, like asking their opinions about how to cure the uh, economic problems or achieve um, economic modernization. Then they applied American advisors' plans and budget distribution over the modernization projects, uh, the, thanks to the uh, thanks to the funded by the Marshall Plan. So in three years after the plan, numerous American companies achieved a lot in Turkey. So they improved infrastructure, electrified the country, building dams, delivered their service, and also many American products like tractors, fertilizers pharmaceutical products and machinery made presence in Turkey. And I, I must say that all please the Turkish decisions. So these initiatives, like uh, they did not only eliminate skepticism uh, towards the West, Westerners in Turkish aspect, but also formed a kind of a solid trust on, especially on the American political, economic and business institutions. So, uh, after three years of Marshall Plan, I can say that we find that Turkey allied itself to the United States, uh, joined NATO, ready to make any economic and cultural changes in terms of like business, and uh, to attract American companies to invest in Turkey, including enacting foreign investment incentive laws or like opening up very sacred national resources like uh, oil business. And we find Turkish voters or Turkish public, let's say, loved American presence in, uh, and products in Turkey and Turkish business elite enjoying partnering up with huge American multinationals who has no cash flow problem or like they can able to uh, provide know-how capability to the domestic market. And we have the Turkish government uh, enjoyed aid and credit deals. Uh, which was enabling them to inject cash to development projects and construct a kind of a sustainable economy. So, right. So that's why I can say that in the early 1950s, only a few like people or communities remained who did not enjoy the American presence in Turkey. It was a kind of a honeymoon, honeymoon period. So political parties promised more American pro products and services for uh, more liberalization in the market. Uh, in 1951 and 1954, Turkey enacted three renewed foreign investment laws, allowed foreign investors to take, take away their profits, uh, which was not allowed before accession to uh, all the sectors in Turkey and the government officially declared that the state in institutions like uh, state-owned enterprises official would revoke their monopolistic privileges and leave all the markets to the fair competition including the oil industry so even uh, actually even the uh, foreign companies were promised to have half of the production and extract the mines of uh, certain products etc or like uh, had uh, uh, kind of a, a significant profitable tax exemptions so these applications brought notable american firms to the turkish market in the 1950s such as uh, mobile oil used to be so in uh, 1940s and before that uh, caltex pfizer general electric federal motor trucks minneapolis moline etc so all these firms built their plans to make production in Turkey, so they generally become monopolies in their business sectors, actually. And the Turkish public pers in Turkish public perspective, people started to access these cons consumer products like tractors, uh, fertilizers, drugs, or home appliances. And the Turkish government was able to reduce uh, currencies spent on imports. Uh, created jobs for for people and sustained development development projects with sharing cost with uh, these multinationals. So it was a kind of a win-win and a third-win situation. 
So all these developments were the direct result of the diligent work of the American advisors and diplomats. Uh, they prepared country studies, pointed out profitable sectors to their companies, and uh, brought American multinationals together with the Turkish decision makers and business elites. So even a, even they took part in law in for progress, for example, and uh, Clarence Randall uh, was entitled Chief Economic Advisor of the Eisenhower uh, administration at Turkey. He convinced the Turkish government for the necessity of such a, such a, such incentives incentives in 1953. Ambassador George McGee, who used to work in oil industry back in the United States, offered his consult and network to bring along other specialists. He introduced the notable petroleum law specialist slash geologist Max Ball to the Turkish decision makers. And the petroleum law of 1954 was mostly drafted by Ball himself. So all these figures were in common knowing Turkey very well and getting along with the decision makers and having background in business sectors. And I guess I need to open that part a little bit more. It is. I must say that it is no coincidence that the American diplomats, economic consultants, and experts prepared country study of Turkey have previously held executive positions in American multinational companies. Uh, the fact that the, the, UA, the studies and laws enacted under the supervision of these people were prepared to make uh, American companies who would in, in, invest in Turkey to make feel them at home. And it was a quite normal result. So even some of these figures, after completing their official missions in Turkey, such as Leon Dayton, the former uh, chief of ECA operations in Turkey, Max Westham Thornburg, he was the ECA's petroleum business specialist. They returned to Turkey in the 1950s, late 1950s. They started to represent American firms to invest in, uh, or they just became the consultant of prime minister, for example. So I see that, uh, Turkey learned so much from uh, these people, and it was not only abandoning statist economic approaches. So we see that in 1950s, political leaders of Turkey hiring American economists to understand how to think and act like an American businessman in, in a liberal market. Or state institutions, including the Turkish embassy in Washington and other consulates, they were focusing on like advertisement campaign, ca campaigns in the United States. And after being granted investment opportunities in Turkey, American business executives such as Conrad Hilton, uh, Louis Owen, uh, Philip Reed, or uh, Jacob Blaustein, they became a kind of a uh, Turkish lobbyists in the United States. Even in the 1950s, Turkey officially hired the former presidential candidate and New York governor Thomas Tevi as the business lobbyist of Turkey in the United States. And in, in addition to that, the Harvard's academics headed to Turkey to establish uh, the first business school in Turkey under the auspices of the Istanbul Un University. So with the financial support of uh, Mobil Oil or Ford uh, to settle American business culture in Turkey. So it's a kind of a win-win situation for these companies. Again, it's, so they were investing in the Turks actually to train them as a kind of a talent managers for their companies in the future. So, right. so main scope of my work is to examine the investment motivations, capital uh, and earnings targets, economic and political reservations of American multinational companies that entered the Turkish market in uh, above mentioned process. So within the time period that I'm covering, uh, nearly uh, 50 American companies entered the Turkish markets. Uh, some take part of selling their products. Some of them like, just uh, help Turkey to in their development projects. And some of them were establishing partnerships with the Turkish investors. And they brought various amounts of foreign capital in, and expertise in cash and in kind to Turkey. Uh, as a result of 15 year period, total American foreign direct investment was around $50 million. And this amount is far below if you compare like the $1 billion aid grants and loans provided Turkey in the uh, 1950s, or it was well below still like the total United States foreign direct investments in the world, which was uh, around uh, $29 billion. So 
And also transformation was slow. Uh, Turkey was not an industrial country in the late 1950s yet. And uh, Turkey fully reaching an American economic model was a kind of a long-term goal. So uh, why this topic is still important and why did I study this one? So neither the scope nor the purpose of this study is concerned with the results. I, the scope of the study is shaped by not economic results, but required many components, uh, such as new economic policies shaped to attract uh, American invest investors, uh, changing governmental uh, attitudes, uh, American actors constructing a reliable American credibility in Turkey. So in this process, many American multinational corporations enter the Turkish market. In fact, all in all, they, these brands were uh, penetrating the Turkish market, creating a kind of a competitive market, just like in the United States, and enhanced the state modernization, which was ever been on the political agenda of the Turkish government since the foundation. So all intensified and, and all around Americanization in Turkey, including foreign policy, military alliance, the economics. I mean, the, the Turkish decision makers of the 1950s were proudly calling themselves themselves as the agents of to build up a kind of a little America in Turkey. So it was their motto in politics. Uh, so let me finish my words with a kind of a business comparison from 1945 and 1960. Uh, in 1945, Turkey had no pharmaceutical plans to manufacture drugs. Uh, they were importing drugs from uh, mostly from Bayer, a German manufacturer, and thanks to the clearing agreement between the Turkey and Germany. So, and drugs were kind of scarce and, and expensive due to the important deal. But if we just look at the 1960, Turkey had a three American, uh, one French, uh, two German, and an Italian plants like manufacturing pharmaceutical products for the Turkish markets. Uh, Turkey's current top drug manufacturer, Eczacıbaşı, built up its brand by the partnering up with these American companies in the 1950s. So all in all, therefore, I feel American actors and multinational companies should be praised in terms of evaluating all around such achievements, I guess. So that's all. Thank you very much for listening and your attention. Thank you. That was really interesting and fascinating, and we learned a lot, I think. So, uh, right now, because we are well behind the schedule, I'd like to open the floor for questions and comments. So, uh, if you have any comments or questions, please raise your hands up. Yes, uh, Anna, please. Yes, thank you. I would have let's ask you a question to, to Murat. Um, I, I mean, you very much praised the relationship between Turkey and, and uh, the US in the 1950s. So it's, it's clear that it was a high mutual and beneficial. Uh, but nevertheless, you started to say that uh, Turkey was regarded as well as a, back, a backward country. I mean, the, the whole region was regarded as backward in that sense, the further, the further east, the more backward. Uh, so still, it feels that from, from at least this perception, the uh, relation was, was very, very much unequal. Was this somehow? Uh, um, did you find any discourse about that? So was that somehow reflected in a uh, Turkish discourse that well, while economic uh, relations profit, uh, still there is an, let's say, uh, uh, let's say uh, ambiguity in terms of, of uh, social perception and perception of each other? Uh, sure. So uh, I guess that like the, this, the backwardness about Turkey was that they, they mostly based on the American documents, like the, the, the American advisors arrived in Turkey, so they I don't know what they expect to see, but they didn't see what they expected to see, actually. So they thought that, yeah, Turkey had a kind of a state-owned enterprises in these days, and they uh, were producing and manufacturing diff different types of, like, light industry stuff. Uh, and also, like, Turkey had a kind of a metropolitan cities like Istanbul, Ankara. They seemed to be kind of advanced cities. But I guess like it was not they they they, uh, they were not enough for the American expectations I guess and and in, in the first place when the, the Americans arrived in Turkey, uh, Turkey was expecting something like like so they are going to bring our some cash like so we will just fuel up our uh, heavy industries 
and like we will achieve a kind of a quick modernization, etc. But actually, it was not the idea of uh, Marshall Plan and etc. So they were thinking about that making Turkey a kind of a agricultural industry or something like that to feed the Europe and make a uh, integrated market with the European uh, allies, the other allies of NATO and etc. So yeah, I guess that's that's my answer for that. Uh, can you please do something because you're still sharing your, your screen? And I would like to ask the other presenters to please come back. Right. With your camera. Still there. Okay, still we have uh, another question in the meantime. But I cannot see properly the name, so for me it shows that home. Maybe if I yes. pronounce it well. Floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. It's uh, tied into it's my like student account, so I can't change it. Um, my uh, my question is for Miss uh, Gritza uh, regarding your presentation on the social scientist and radio for your. Uh, first of all, very fascinating topic, very interesting. I was intrigued by the first part of your presentation, though, where you said how there was a great deal of discrediting and pushback against um, social scientists at the end of the Cold War due to the failure to predict the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, however, my research has shown that actually there, there was a huge trend towards embracing economics, especially Washington consensus free market economics. In a lot of the terms you described, universal application, Essentially, it's like the laws of physics. It's the same everywhere. Society and culture don't matter. Um, and I was just wondering if uh, you have gained any insights into this, um, this, this contradiction. Well, I, I wouldn't say it's such a contradiction, um, especially if I think that in terms of economics, the relationship can be traced much further back. So the idea of convergence, that the world system will economically converge, that uh, it's a global, uh, a global economy and a global world that finally shapes both systems anyway, whether with the Soviet or US American, that there is, uh, uh, let's say, this this kind of dependency that uh, makes both systems somehow converge uh, is something that I would, I would kind of stress uh, in terms of economy. I'm not an expert on that, to be honest. So I don't know what the uh, discourse was uh, after after the collapse and uh, after 1989 and the 1990s. Um, what I still believe as a social scientist is that um, they were very much indeed criticized not to have been as well a more uh, conscious about social history. I mean, social history, more or less, 1970s started to to gain more and more more ground, but uh, was not so not so important as as political uh, actors and political circumstances. So I think that might might play in why why the Sovietologists were uh, that much criticized. Um, I think as well predictability. So the idea of forecasting is something that was very strong in the Cold War. So this um, idea to to be able to forecast, to foresee, uh, was something that was ascribed to the Sovietologists very very much. So it was uh, the social scientists who claimed to have this this power to to predict, and uh, that might be as well why the failure was ascribed very much to them. But I I, I assume I don't know. So I, I would have to do more research on that. Thank you. Again, uh, I'd like to ask Mora, please stop your, your screen sharing. Sure. I have or try to do just till we see your, your screen. And I have another question to, to Anna. Um, can you identify uh, the Free Europe radio as a, as a proactive norm carrier? Because it has an enormous literature in international relations theory, the constructivist literature, which frame how non carriers um, uh, shape actors or agents' identities. So that would be very, very fascinating for a historian to put this framework and and sh and see uh, how a non carrier can work in shaping identities and objective identities or what is what is his fault to be objective yes I, I think very much so i'm sorry i didn't get all of your question because there was some some background noise um maybe if you could maybe kind of repeat the beginning
you are muted. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Right now I, I could unmute myself. So the question was that can you identify somehow the radio uh, free Europe as a norm carrier? Because uh, for me, it is. It really sounds familiar, as I've mentioned, I'm familiar with theoretical question in international relations and I'm not a historian and it was fascinating to hear from another discipline that you use those forms and terms what we use in theory. <laughs> so for me, uh, the radio was clearly a proactive norm carrier and it has a huge, a large literature on how norm carriers can frame certain type of identities and what's happening and it gives you a very, very um, diverse uh, framework, methodological framework. So I mean, there are a lot of persons, scholar who has who made an inquiry on that question, not on free, um, free Europe radio, but but generally on the process. I see. Thank you. I, I'm actually not familiar with, uh, with the concept of non carriers in international relations. Uh, what I still believe is that international relations will play in uh, any kind of historic uh, account of, of Radio Free Europe and the borrowing process of, I think, concepts as, as something un unavoidable. Um, well, if non carrier is something, is something like a slightly neutral, so I, I might, of course, stem from Radio Free Europe's uh, uh, position as a, a cultural diplomacy tool. Um, this has to be divided, I think, until the 1970s, so the 1970s is a moment when Radio Free stops to be funded by, by the CIA. But it is, well, it's disclosed that it was funded by the CIA and it's a funding up, up, uh, up, uh, uh, stops after that point. Um, so I think its, its role changes and it gets more uh, a, well, a radio, radio station with much more ambition in, in journalism than it was maybe before and much much less identified with a kind of covered of operation. So I think that that, that should play in when I consider this as a role of Radio Free Europe and how it was perceived expressly uh, as well maybe even as um, uh, I mean backward looking in that sense because not everybody knew or was convinced that it was a uh, CIA funded uh, radio station but still but thank you for for uh, for the hint because I think I I should I should uh, uh, learn something more about about non carriers and, and international relations. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, do you have any comments or question on that section session? So really, I think we have heard fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you, all of you, and I like to give uh, the word to, to the next session.